Rick is losing faith that his radio messages are still being received by Morgan. A fair assumption considering that he's not replied once. He wastes even more of the radio's battery life by telling Morgan about what happened at the CDC. And he teases us into believing that he's going to reveal what Jenna whispered to him. He told me. It doesn't matter. They're on their way to Fort Benning, which is a military base, which makes for a sensible place to check for survivors. In this car, we have Rick, Laurie and Carl sharing their family time stories with Carol and her daughter Sophia, talking to them in a comforting way to recognise the fact that these two have had a crappy home life, but now they're going to be treated like a family by this new group. Can we go see it? The Grand Canyon? I'd like to. I would too. Can we go? We'd never go without you and your mom. That's a promise. In the RV, we have Shane showing Andrea how to maintain a handgun. And I only mention this part because I really like this sign behind Andrea. How about a nice cup of shut the hell up? If there's one thing I hate in this world, it's cringy signs like live, laugh, love. A house is not a home without my dog. I have no personality and rely on cheaply manufactured signs to do the work for me. And so on. Where was I? Oh yeah, on the highway they come to a stop as the road ahead is blocked by abandoned traffic. They carefully snake their way through, but the radiator in Dal's RV gives out, meaning they have to search around for new parts while Dal keeps lookouts on the roof. It's all good. Well, Dal must be blind, because it's not all good. There's a herd of walkers not too far away. My only guess as to how he wouldn't have seen them is if they wandered in from the roadside bushes. But still, he's in a position where he can see a long way down this road, so he doesn't really have an excuse. Everyone ducks under the cars and keeps out of sight. And this is actually pretty scary on first watch. Remember that when this first came out, we hadn't been bombarded by the zombie craze in media just yet. So to a lot of people, scenes like this were very effective. It's especially scary knowing that the kids are out of reach of their parents, as they are more likely to accidentally make noise from being scared. T-Dog accidentally slices his arm open, so that's not good. Luckily, Daryl jumps into action and lays some dead guys on him for camouflage. And then we have Andrea, who was distracted in the wagon and didn't know she was supposed to be hiding. So a rogue walker wanders into the RV and we get this scene of her struggling to keep the walker out of the bathroom. <laughs> It's quite intense and it's also satisfying when she stabs it with a screwdriver. The last one to run into trouble during this walker herd is Sophia. She gets spooked and runs off into the woods. Rick comes to the rescue and guides her to a safe spot so she can hide out while he leads the walkers off somewhere. But when he comes back, she's gone. And so the hunt for Sophia begins. They search high, they search low. They search inside a tent and search inside a walker. But the one place they didn't look for answers was inside themselves. I want to play a game. They get their hopes up when they hear a church bell, thinking it might be Sophia sending out a signal, but it turns out to be an electronic bell on a timer. Inside the church they find walkers sitting in the pews, which makes for a cool horror moment, but it doesn't really make sense when you think about it. I mean, did they die while sitting down? And if so, this suggests that they all turned at the exact same time, because the walkers eat the living as soon as they turn, and you're not just going to remain seated while someone's eating you. So this seems kind of silly to me. The better part of this episode, in my opinion, is seeing Shane reveal to Laurie that he's planning on running away, which honestly does seem like the best choice for him, considering his past with Laurie. Andrea overhears this and says she wants to join him, as she feels that she's just as much as an outcast for some reason. We're gonna sail off from the sunset together. We're gonna hold hands. I'm not asking you to go steady, Shane. I'm asking for a ride, a chance to start over somewhere else. The episode ends in a shocking way. Carl spots a deer and creeps in closer for a better look. A magical moment for Rick and Shane, who look on in awe of this rare moment. And then out of nowhere, pop, a bullet goes flying through the deer and into Carl. No, 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 no. Well, that's what he gets for wearing camo.
Before we continue on, I want to quickly address the show creator Frank Darabont's controversy with AMC. Long story short is that AMC essentially fired him from the show after demanding that he works with a smaller budget. A massively insulting request when you consider how much of a massive financial success this show is. And if you want to hear about it in more detail, I highly recommend you go watch this video by Your Movie Sucks, a creator I highly respect. So when talking about The Walking Dead, I'm going to try my hardest to not duplicate anything he says about the show, something which will no longer be a problem for me soon as he hasn't covered past season 2. The opening is uneventful, but it's a good flashback as we hear how Laurie was having doubts about her marriage, which might explain why she was so quick to move on to Shane. You still love Rick? I've been asking myself that a lot and... Back to the present, Rick is cradling Carl in his arms as he sprints across a field. He was shot by this guy who was out hunting, and we later learn that his name is Otis. Otis tells him to go find a guy called Herschel at the farmhouse. And when he gets there, Herschel jumps into action to save Carl's life. I've got a heartbeat. It's faint. I got it. Step back. As Rick goes to get some fresh air, Shane does an excellent job at trying to keep him calm and helping to wipe the blood from his face. Andrew Lincoln's acting here is pretty great. He really looks like a dad fearing the loss of his son. Added on top of this guilt is the guilt of losing Sophia in the woods. Both things not being his fault, bearing in mind. Herschel's eldest daughter Maggie rides off on a horse to find Laurie and tell her the news and I like that the group didn't immediately trust this stranger until she gave them more details to show that she knows who they are. All I know is this chick rode out of nowhere like Zora on a horse and took Laurie. You let her? I'm done out of my ass old man. Rick sent her. She knew Laurie's name and Carl. With Carl eventually stabilised, Herschel tells Rick that without the right equipment to remove the bullet fragments, this kid's gone die. Otis steps up and says he knows what medical equipment is needed, and he also knows where to find it. He teams up with Shane and they go to this school turned FEMA camp, and after finding the supplies and trying to get back out, they get cornered into locking themselves behind a gate. I really like the structure of this one, where the opening is mysterious, and we have to wait until the end of the episode to get the answer to this mystery, going back to the opening shot of Shane shaving his hair off. This is the episode where Daryl becomes more likeable. He takes pity on Carol as she lays there sobbing, not knowing if Sophia is still alive. And even though they spent all day looking for her, he's willing to pull a night shift to keep searching. You really think we're gonna find Sophia? You got that look on your face, same as everybody else. What the hell's wrong with you people? You just started looking. They come back empty handed, but still the fault was there. During their hunt, we get some background story from Daryl, and we get to learn how tough his childhood was. Often having to look after himself where his dad was always drunk, and older brother Merle was in and out of prison. Back at the farm, Laurie is questioning whether or not she wants their son to make it, knowing that this world will never be a place where he can be happy and live a normal life. Rick stays firm in his position that they have fought to survive this long because there is still hope. Despite how cold Laurie appears here versus hopeful Rick, you can understand her feelings. To have this life so that he can see more people torn apart in front of him, so that he can be hungry and scared for however long he has before he... They ultimately come back together as an emotional unit as they have to watch their son seizing out on the bed. And acting wise, that's a pretty convincing seizure. <laughs> Otis and Shane are on the run from walkers, and at first they seem like comrades, with Shane trying to give solutions where they can both make it out alive. You take three shots and you go. After that, I fire. I lay down a cover for you. I'll get you a lead. <laughs> Unfortunately, they both injure their ankles as they make their separate paths to the escape route, but still they manage to regroup and hobble along together right up until the moment where all hope seems lost, and then Shane's ruthless urge to survive gets the better of him. I'm sorry. Shane wrestles the backpack of supplies away from Otis as he manages to rip out some hairs from Shane's head. And now Shane's patchy haircut is evidence of their scrap, which is perhaps one of the reasons why Shane decides to shave it all off. Well, that reason plus this new image reflects the changed man he feels when looking in the mirror. Shane is requested to speak at Otis's funeral, wearing his clothes no less, as they were the only ones spare that would fit him. Gonna sleep with his wife next? 
The fact that he would willingly wear the guy's clothes to his funeral shows how Shane's dark side is overtaking the good. We gotta save the boy. See, that's what he said. Glenn buddies up with Maggie to go on a supply run, and he's quickly developed a crush on her. Yep, you and every other man watching, Glenn. Holy hell. Before they leave, Laurie asks him to get something secret from the drugstore, and we'll find out what exactly soon. When they get to the drugstore, Maggie dominates him in conversation and gets him all flustered, before saying she wants to have sex with him, because it's the end of the world and she has no better choice. I'm sorry, is this episode called Glenn Gathers Supplies in Heaven? Herschel, in the politest way possible, tells Rick that he wants him and the crew to bugger off when Carl is on his feet again, which is a smart decision because the more people you have in one location, the more likely you are to draw attention from walkers. And so far, this farmhouse has faced no problematic walker situations. Well, there is one walker causing a problem right now. It's stuck down this water well, and everyone starts wondering if this bloated, pus-dripping walker with open wounds across its torso might have maybe infected the water. They somehow think that pulling it out will prevent the water from being infected. But even if you were successful in doing this, there's no way you'd convince anyone to drink from the well. That's what I always I wouldn't drink that if I were you. They send Glenn down to try and tie a rope around its neck, but then the rope support breaks and Glenn almost gets eaten. If the end goal of what they were trying to accomplish here wasn't so stupid, this might have been a tense scene. Then they manage to tie a bigger loop around its body and start to pull it out. But because the body is so decomposed, it splits in two like a soggy pancake roll. Good thing we didn't do anything stupid like shoot it. The episode is called Cherokee Rose because that's the flower Daryl gives to Carol as it symbolises hope in a Native American folktale or something. It's nice to see Daryl still stepping up and trying to be a good part of the group. It balances out the negative in the group with Shane's evil side creeping in and Andrea who keeps being a real bitch towards Dale. Dale's trying really hard to be a protective father figure and she hasn't really done anything to show that she appreciates the effort. She just kind of sulks off at him all the time. I'm not your wife and I'm sure as hell not your problem. That's all there is to say. I get that his behaviour kind of comes across as controlling, but still it wouldn't hurt to show that you acknowledge the love and care he's showing towards you, while at the same time expressing that you don't want it. Well anyway, the episode ends with Laurie using the secret item that Glenn got her, and this pregnancy test shows her that she's got a bun in the oven. One thing I really like about Fear the Walking Dead, the prequel series, is that you get to see the zombie apocalypse in its early stages. I enjoy seeing society collapsing as it tries to deal with the outbreak, so the opening to this episode really pleases me, as it's a flashback to a time before anyone knew what was happening. We get to see the gang stuck in traffic while they can hear explosions going off in the distance, and when they go to investigate, they see that napalm is being dropped on buildings in an attempt to stop the spread of the disease. The episode is called Chupacabra because Daryl believes that Chupacabras exist, and when Rick laughs at him for this, Daryl makes the reasonable argument of saying walkers exist now, so it's not that much of a stretch to say that Chupacabras could exist. Well, apart from the fact that we have actual evidence of walkers existing. There's a super funny moment where Glenn tries to act all smooth to Maggie, but instead he just comes across real desperate. You know, we, uh, we still have 11 condoms. Yeah, you see 11 condoms, I see 11 minutes of my life I'm never getting back. I don't even know if I like you. But you're thinking about it. You should. Another great part of this episode is seeing Rick and Shane reminisce about their college days, talking about typical guy stuff, which makes their friendship seem more authentic. This will be an important feeling to hold on to for future events. Shane cuts the pleasantries to remind Rick that this search for Sophia has become more of a risk to the group at this point, reminding Rick that their police training taught them that after a certain amount of time, you're likely just going to be looking for a body. Daryl off out on his own, gets knocked off his horse when he gets spooked, and he tumbles down a rocky waterfall, unfortunately managing to stab himself with his own arrow. He tries to get back up the hill and falls down again, and while laying semi-conscious, he hallucinates Merle mocking him. Look at you, lying in the dirt like a used rubber. You're gonna die on here, little brother. Merle manages to convince him that he's the black sheep of the group and is being traitorous to his roots by working with them. The interesting part about this, of course, is that Merle isn't actually there, so this train of thought is actually coming from Daryl's subconscious. His insecurity of not being good enough to be anything other than a redneck. You're nothing but a freak to them. Redneck trash. 
that's all y'all. Yeah, they're laughing at you behind your back. He regains full consciousness to find that Merle isn't the one tapping his foot. It's a walker biting his boot. <laughs> Approaching the farm, Andrea mistakes him for a walker, and where she's been so desperate to prove herself as a useful guard who doesn't need Dal's protection, she takes the shot, despite the rest of the group being close enough to deal with it themselves. Oh my god! Oh my god, is he dead? Unconscious. You just grazed him. I do feel slightly bad for her here, but she's still a massive idiot for doing this. Maggie reads a note from Glenn saying, hey, let's go bang in the barn. So Maggie freaks out and sprints to the barn, knowing what Glenn's going to find in there. You weren't supposed to see this. Herschel's wife, insert name here, breaks the legs on some chickens so that she can feed the walkers in the barn. But why break their legs when they have no means of escape anyway? It just seems needlessly cruel. Glenn is trying to keep the walker barn a secret, but he has the worst poker face imaginable. So, nothing. Nothing that's why. He's also struggling with the secret of Laurie's pregnancy, trying his best to look out for her by making sure she's eating enough and such. You need to eat. You're too skinny. He lets slip to Dale before the episode is even halfway done. Stop being dramatic. Spit it out. There's, there's walkers in the barn and Laurie's pregnant. Carl wants to learn how to shoot, so he reveals to Shane that he snuck a gun from somewhere. So Shane tells on him to his parents, and so they debate the idea of giving him gun training. Dow immediately confronts Herschel about the barn, and we learn that Herschel very much regards the walkers as sick people, who deserve to be kept alive until they can find a cure. They're dangerous. Paranoid schizophrenic is dangerous too. We don't shoot sick people. Turns out one of the walkers in the barn is a family member, which explains the extra secrecy of it, knowing that Rick's group would heartlessly put them all down if they knew. Shane is giving Andrea gun training and gets a little too intense with it. He's feet away! He's not feet! He's five feet away right there! That's the walker that got Amy! Now you shoot that son of a bitch! Shoot him! Laurie gets Glenn to run into town to get her abortion pills, and when doing this they run into a walker, which wouldn't be a big deal, but Maggie is still new to this. <laughs> Laurie feels conflicted on taking the pills, chucking them up immediately ah. after swallowing them. Shane and Andrea boink ah. after their daily Sophia search, and when they get back, Dal heavily suggests that he's becoming a danger to the group, and he also suspects that he killed Otis, since he's the kind of man who would point a gun at his best friend. See, I'm the kind of man who gunned down his own best friend. What do you think I'd do to some guy that I don't even like? When he starts throwing accusations my way, what you think? Rick finds the pills, and the two argue about their trust issues. And finally, she reveals her affair with Shane. The world went to shit, and you thought I was dead? Right? Nah, I thought Shane was just hotter than you. You were very much alive. This happened yesterday, and twice again today at lunchtime. Given Dal's nod of approval, Glenn decides to tell the group about the walker barn so that they can discuss it as a group, a discussion which gets Shane all riled up, as he rightly calls it out for being a needless danger to the group. We either gotta go in there, we gotta make things right, or we just gotta go. Now, we have been talking about Fort Benning for a we long can't time. Now, why, Rick? Why? Herschel tells Rick to respect his farm and rules by ignoring the barn. There is no barn full of walkers and asks that he regards them as sick people. Rick, trying his best to keep the gang on the farm, knows he has to play the game Herschel's way, going as far as to help him collect more walkers for the barn. Pull him! Ah. Lead him! Lead him, Rick! Ah. You have a carrot, not the stick! Ah. What? Ah. You heard me! Just lead him! This scene always reminds me of the bad lip-reading channel and their legendary Walking Dead videos. Hey! It's hurting my neck! Christine! I know what it takes to make you hot. I need a man that can decorate and mix my brew. When they arrive back home with the walkers, Shane's patience can be pushed no more, and he goes to reasonable lengths to prove to Herschel that these people are no longer human. Did a living, breathing person, did they walk away from this? No! Oh! Stop putting your eyes in the chest! Could someone who's alive, could they just take that? Why is it still coming? That's a tart! 
It's lost. Yeah. Why is it still coming? Enough. Hey, you right, man. That is enough. Despite Shane's increasing level of aggression, it's hard not to side with him here, and we're about to see just how right he is. He lets the walkers out of the barn, and they get disposed of quickly, but then taking her sweet time for a dramatic reveal, Sophia appears from the darkness. It's hard not to get a bit choked up here, watching everyone's face realising that this whole time she was in the barn. But wait a minute, let's talk about this for a second. She's been missing for what must have only been a week, and no one who was helping Herschel to get walkers in the barn took any notice that they put a little girl in there, the only kid in this whole barn. A barn they've returned to at least a couple of times to feed them and to put more walkers in. And what, there's maybe about 20 walkers in here? And you somehow don't notice, Sophia? This for me was very distracting, in an otherwise great and emotional scene. In the next episode, Herschel's excuse is that Otis stored most of the walkers. But still, wouldn't you look in the barn to see if this group's missing girl is among them? It would have taken anyone in this family two seconds to solve the mystery. This is the first episode where a chunk of it is boring to watch. We just watch everyone mope about because of what happened. Shane's part is okay though. We watch him get frustrated at people like Dale, who don't appreciate that he's trying to keep everyone safe. And he makes a good point questioning what Dale has done lately, apart from sitting up on the RV as lookout. I smashed that barn open. I saved Carl. That's me. That ain't you. That ain't Rick. That's me. Tell you what, Dale. Next time I need a, uh, a radiator hose. <laughs> I give you a call, man. I like Dal's character, and he is, as we know, right about Shane being dangerous. But here he should be treating Shane with a little respect, even if it's just to keep the man on his good side. His suspicions, after all, are just that. He has no evidence that Shane has done anything wrong. Herschel's youngest daughter, Beth, collapses and goes into a state of shock. This is Beth, by the way. I made a mistake in the first season calling Andrea's sister Beth when her name was Amy. I have no clue how I made that mistake, as we hadn't even met Beth yet. Herschel isn't around to help his daughter as he's run off somewhere. Rick takes a step at a guess that he went back to his old watering hole, where he used to get drunk all the time. This part of the episode is pretty good. It's essentially just Herschel explaining that he feels like a fool for believing that walkers were still human, and now he feels that all hope is lost. When Shane shot Lou in the chest, and she just kept coming, that's when I knew what an ass I'd been. That Annette had been dead long ago, and I was feeding her rotten corpse. That's when I knew there was no hope. Just as Rick convinces him to come back home, two suspect looking guys come into the bar. Straight away, their vibes come across as untrustworthy, with this greasy dude wearing a shark t shirt, and his friend is taking a piss right there in the same room as everyone else. And then they start insisting that they're going to come join them on the farm, unwilling to take no for an answer. So Rick shoots them both dead. The other noteworthy event in this episode is that Laurie decides to come look for Rick and manages to crash the car in this overly dramatic way when all she did was hit one walker. Oopsie doopsie. As they go to leave the bar, the dead guy's people rock up looking for them. And when they suspect that there's people in the bar, instead of talking quietly among themselves to form a plan, they speak out loud like some video game NPCs. So they make the player aware of what's coming. We're just looking for our friends. What did we do? Bum rush the door? No, we don't know how many are there, just relax. We don't want any trouble. After a quick shootout to track some walkers, the strangers decide to run away. But when their rooftop marksman falls off the roof, they leave without him. Rick decides he can't leave the kid hurting, so he goes over to see what's up, and he sees that his leg is impaled on the fence. Herschel says the humane way of dealing with this is to shoot him. Rick persists in trying until there's little time before the walkers arrive, so they push his leg back up the way it came in, which in my mind was always the best option they had. I mean, surely the damage to the leg was already done on entry, so why not just make the leg go back the way it came? Laurie is also in a spot of bother, as a walker is pushing its head through the windshield as she tries to escape the car. She manages to get out and makes her way up the road. Shane catches up to her a while later and tells her that everyone's back at the farm. She believes him and goes back and naturally gets pissed at him when she finds out he's lying. Lori. Hey, my Lord, husband. Lord, I will go Where after him. I? I will find him. Hey. Now look, first things first, I gotta, I gotta look after you. I gotta make sure the baby's all right, okay? 
She later reveals to Shane that she told Rick about the affair, and it's cool to see Shane's internal conflict about hurting his best friend and having Laurie all to himself, a desire of which seems to be reignited in a major way as he pushes himself further away from the group. Speaking of pushing away, this is undoubtedly Daryl's weakest moment in the show so far. He's lost all sympathy and care for Carol and just wants to be left alone. The imaginary words of Merle no doubt still plaguing his mind. You're afraid. You're afraid because you're all alone. You got no husband, no daughter. You don't know what to do with yourself. The episode ends with Laurie telling Rick about Shane's intentions to get Laurie back and raise Carl and the baby as his own. Shane thinks I'm he thinks the baby's his. Rick and Shane are on the road, taking the leg injury guy away from the farm now that he's healed. His name is Randall. Watching the world pass by, Shane notices this lonely, creepy walker guy traipsing through the field, and he sees it still walking on its own when they make their way back later in the episode. It's a neat visual that to me reflects the way Shane's feeling right now, as the isolated monster who's going nowhere fast. Halfway to the safe drop-off zone, 18 miles out from the farm, Rick confronts Shane about his possessiveness of Laurie and the baby, and the way this conversation was handled shows that Rick still very much respects Shane and wants them to move past what happened so they can work together. That is my wife. That is my son. That is my unborn child. I will stay alive to keep them alive. Now, the only way you and me keep on is that you accept everything I just said right here, right now, and we move forward with that understanding. They arrive at a place they deem safe enough, and they leave Randall tied up with a knife nearby that he can crawl to. But this kid's more scared of being alone than he is being under their control, and he makes the mistake of telling them that he knows Maggie, which is a real problem considering that the whole point of bringing him out here was that he didn't know where the farm was, and therefore wouldn't tell his people. Shane of course reacts aggressively and wants to shoot him, and Rick to no surprise wants to find another way, which creates a heated debate which turns into a fist fight. <laughs> Shane throws a wrench and it smashes a window, waking up the walkers inside. Rick manages to get away with Randall, but Shane gets stuck in this bus. But Rick isn't about to abandon his friend. He and Randall drive back and get Shane to jump from the bus. Back at the farm, Beth is having some intrusive self-deletion thoughts as she's unable to cope with the loss of her mother. Andrea offers to keep an eye on her to allow Maggie to rest, and instead of staying with her, she leaves the room. Thanks, bye. What kind of idiot leaves a distressed teenager who's thinking of taking their own life? Very common Andrea L. <laughs> in there a hurt glass. It's really cringe at the end too, when Andrea's told that Beth didn't cut deep enough so she's going to be okay. And instead of apologizing, Andrea takes it as a cue to diminish the poor choice she made of abandoning her. How bad is she? What deep? <sighs> she wants to live. She made her decision. Randall is back in chains being interrogated by Daryl. When he gives up information about his group, he also decides to tell Daryl about a camp they invaded where he saw some teenage girls there. We found this little campsite. A man and his two daughters, teenagers, you know? Real young, real cute. Here's a tip. When pleading for your life, maybe don't reveal to your captor that you're a kid diddler. The majority of this episode is the group debating on the fate of Randall, with Dal being the only person determined to keep him from the hangman's noose. The conversation starts to feel stale, with Dal relentlessly making the same points to different people, but that feeling of the conversation going nowhere reflects how Dal is feeling in the situation. When the debate enters the decision stage, Dal gets really emotional, torn up at the idea that this group have lost their humanity. But don't you see, if we do this, the, the people that we were, the, the world the world that we knew is dead. While this is happening, Carl is entering his rebellious stage. He tells Carol that heaven doesn't exist and her daughter is just plain dead. Heaven is just another lie. And if you believe it, you're an idiot. And he sneaks a gun from Daryl's pack and goes off to the swamps to mess with a walker. He almost gets himself killed when he gets a little bit too close. It starts to wiggle free from the mud with the temptation of a meal. <laughs> 
And although we can sit here and I roll about how stupid Carl is being here, this is just the kind of thing kids do. As Dal goes to clear his head, he comes across a wounded animal that appears to be torn open by a walker. But what walker? Oh, this one. <laughs> And unfortunately, he manages to rip open Dal's stomach like a grizzly bear. When the group run to his side, Carl notices it's the same walker he encountered earlier, so naturally feels like he's to blame. And here we have a very sad send off for Dal, with Daryl being the one to ease his pain. Sorry, brother. It's a real shame because Dow added a nice balance to the group. He was the one person who had the spine to stand up for what he believed in, even if it made him the unpopular one. So from now on, without Dow here, we can expect no pushback if the group wants to make cruel decisions against a person's life. Rick's opening funeral speech accurately describes how the group is much worse off now, for the same reasons I laid out in the previous episode. So the only one left who can stand up to Shane is his best friend. Let's see how that goes. Herschel's had a change of heart after all that's happened, and decides that not only can they stay on the farm, but he welcomes them into the house, offering his bed to Laurie as she's preggers in it. I don't know if it's the pregnancy hormones crossing wires in her brain, but she decides it's a good idea to start complimenting Shane on how much better he is than Rick sometimes. It's like that time you uh, showed up Rick fixing our sink. <laughs> An idea of hers that maybe had innocent intentions behind it to try and get him to be nice again, but she has no idea how much men thrive on the smallest of compliments. Women, if you're watching this, tell a guy you think he's a 6 out of 10 and watch him skip home like you just fondled his foghorn. With this glimmer of hope reignited, he tries again to be a father figure to Carl, talking to him about the gun he snuck from Daryl's pack. Carl asks him not to tell his parents, but Shane sees this as a chance to get Rick to focus on his son, and less on Randall, who is still locked up in the shed. Rick sees past this trickery and commands Shane to stay put, and wait until Rick is ready to deal with the Randall situation. I think he wants to talk to his father. Why well, I need this Randall thing done already. Freeing that prisoner. <laughs> More important to you than Carl. Shane grows impatient with the situation, as you'd expect, so he sneaks Randall out into the woods to finally put an end to this guy's life. Can't say it's about me, just trying to... Ah! He then breaks his own nose to pretend that Randall got the jump on him and escaped. I really like how Daryl immediately calls bullshit on this, wondering how a little skinny kid could get the better of a well-built policeman. He smells foul play for sure when he finds that Jimmy's neck was broken, which led him to becoming a walker. As night time comes and they're still on their supposed search for Jimmy, Rick realises that Shane has deliberately separated him from the group, so that he can finally do what he's been dying to do. So this is where you plan to do it? Good place is any. At least have the balls to call this what it is. Rick calmly approaches him with the pretense of disarming him and stabs him with his concealed stabber. Damn you for making me do this shit. This was you, not me. You did this to us. This was you, not me. Rick breaks down after doing what he had no choice to do, and it really does suck to see Shane go like this. To have the protagonist's best friend slowly turn into the antagonist of the show was a great choice that made for a compelling story. Carl looks on, traumatised, obviously missing the context to explain why Shane is now dead, but before Rick has time to explain what happened, Shane rises from the dead. <laughs> Carl notices Shane approaching, and instead of telling Daddy to duck, he risks his life by shooting past his head to take out Shane. For a kid who's barely had any gun training, he managed to headshot a moving target in the dark, 50 yards away with his dad's head dangerously close to his line of sight. Damn kids in their aimbot hacks. As they walk away, the camera pans up, and we see a great big herd of walkers drawn in by the gunfire. This opening is awesome. It simply shows you how walkers, in their instinctive herd behaviour, change their direction based on new noises, and Carl firing his gun starts the walker event of this final episode. 
I really love how the dark of night hides the walkers as they trail behind Rick and Carl. So the whole time as you watch them walking along, you wonder when they're going to turn around and see the walkers behind them. When they finally do notice, it's a little too late to draw them away from the farmhouse. Daryl advises everyone to evacuate, but Herschel refuses. This is my farm. I'll die here. All right. It's a good night as any. That was amazing dialogue. I love the idea that Herschel won't just give up the only home he's ever known, even though in doing so, he's putting himself and his family in grave danger. Rick and Carl set the barn on fire to draw the walkers away, and it works, but only on some walkers and not on all walkers, as many of them ignore the fire and continue towards the house. I'm not sure if this makes sense, but I'll run with it. I like how disorientating this chaotic scene is to watch. It perfectly reflects the panic everyone feels as they attempt to regroup and make their escape. Patricia gets eaten and Andrea gets lost in the crowd. And so for now, the group are temporarily separated. Herschel's left with no choice but to abandon the farm. And you really feel for him as he watches the life he once knew go up in flames. Rick, Carl and Herschel wait on the highway in the hopes that everyone else has the same idea, which luckily they do. It's here where they talk about the people they think they've lost and the ones they have definitely lost and the ones they have definitely lost, like Shane and Patricia. That one's on under again. Just... <laughs> Patricia was your wife, Herschel. Maybe look a little more upset? No? Okay then. They debate what happened before with the Jimmy situation and everyone questions how Jimmy turned. And so now Rick feels it's time to reveal what Dr. Jenner told him. We're all infected by the CDC. Jenner told me whatever it is, we all carry it. Everyone gets pissed at Rick for keeping this information. And in this case, I find myself siding with Rick. In a hopeless world, why would you give your friends and family even less of a reason to keep fighting? Tensions continue to rise that evening, with everyone applying pressure on Rick to come up with a plan. I am doing something. I'm keeping this group together, alive. I didn't ask for this. I killed my best friend for you people for Christ's sake. As the season draws to a close, the camera pans up and shows that across the river to their temporary camp is a big old prison. So that's exciting. Oh, and also, Andrea gets saved by this mysterious hooded person swinging a katana around. So that's exciting too. Season 3 opens by skipping over the season of winter, a harsh and challenging time that Rick was talking about in season 2. We need dry goods ahead of the winter. Warm clothes, fuel. At first, I thought this episode was a direct continuation of the last episode, but Laurie being heavily pregnant now indicates some months have passed. I gotta say, I feel cheated by this. Watching the gang survive against walkers in winter conditions would have made for a nice new experience, but it looks like we're just going to be getting more Georgia sunshine instead. Complaints aside, this opening offered a new experience in that we get to see the gang at a real low point, not saying a single word to each other, and trying to keep their spirits up while being reduced to eating dog food and owls. <laughs> and they are constantly being pushed out from their resting spots by walkers. Rick and Daryl find the prison and a look of relief washes over them, knowing that this place will be their ticket to safety. They cut their way into the fence and begin forming a plan to clear out the yard, with some of the gang using the holes in the fence to safely stab the walkers. Now, how can anyone watching this not be confused as to why they didn't just stay outside taking the walkers out using this method? It's the safest option possible. But instead, Rick runs around inside to seal off the gate to the courtyard. Which, yeah, I understand doing this means it separates the walker crowds. But still, given enough time, if you were to stay by the fence, all of the walkers would eventually come over to you so you can safely poke them all to death. <laughs> After resting for an evening, they proceed to clear out the inner yard, again taking a far riskier approach than I would have. We get this cool scene where walkers in riot gear pose a new type of threat. Wearing this riot gear, they can't easily eat anyone, but they're also tougher to kill. <laughs> The inside of the prison is creepy as hell, but luckily appears to be abandoned with only a few walkers to deal with. So finally, they feel like they can rest in the securest place imaginable. 
Outside of the prison, Andrea is recovering from a flu or something, under the guard of the samurai woman we saw before. Her name is Michonne. Michonne has two walker companions on chains, whose arms and jaws have been ripped off, and we'll find out why she's done this a little later on. Before the gang get too comfortable, they need to explore the rest of the prison and look for supplies. And while they creep through this eerie hallway, a group of walkers give them a spook and split them up. Go back! As Herschel tries to find everyone, a walker wakes up and bites his leg. They rush him into a seemingly empty room, and Rick does not hesitate in hacking off his leg to save his life. <laughs> After this butchering, Daryl spots some prisoners in the next room. Preoccupied with trying to save Herschel's life, Rick and the others don't get acquainted with these new prison buddies. But for the sake of reference, I'll give this main guy a name. We'll call him Larry. He looks like a Larry to me. Daryl holds them back while they deal with Herschel's leg. And as the conversation gets heated, Rick comes out to settle them down. How many are you in there? Too many for you to handle. Larry asks why not take Herschel to a hospital, and it's this comment that shows how long they've been locked inside for, unaware of society's collapse. Rick and Larry argue over who gets to stay in the prison, but Rick hasn't come this far to be pushed out from having a safe place for his family, so they come to an agreement. Rick and the gang will remain in C block, and they will help to clear out another block for the prisoners to stay in. They teach the prisoners how to take out walkers, being very clear on the fact that they can only be killed with headshots, but for this moment of comedy, they resort to prison riot tactics with shanking and such. It's pretty silly. They try taking out walkers again using what they've learnt this time, and all goes well until the big guy backs away from the pack and gets a big old scratch by this walker's exposed bone. <laughs> well, that sounded way more sexual than I wanted it to. He tries to claim that he's not infected, but Larry is taking no chances and uses this opportunity to show how dangerous he is. As they continue on, Larry makes multiple attempts to indirectly kill Rick, and I love that Rick's response to this is far less diplomatic than he's been in the previous seasons. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Shit happens. No! One of the prisoners runs off and finds himself being locked into a small courtyard of walkers. You better run. <laughs> and the remaining two prisoners get to live. As I can't remember how long they're going to remain in the series, I'll give them temporary names for now until they become more important characters. This guy is Steve and this other guy is Big Ball Steve. I ain't never bleeded for my life and I ain't about to start now. Herschel eventually wakes up and the first person he reaches out for is Rick. An interesting choice of person, considering that it's because of meeting Rick that he now has no farm, no wife and now no leg. This show's about to get spicy again, as this episode introduces us to the governor. Andrea and Michonne investigate a helicopter crash, and as they're checking for survivors, they see some cars pull up. They hide in the bushes as they watch the governor and his crew search the area. They try to stay as quiet and hidden as possible, but Michonne's walker companions are getting all excited from seeing these people. <laughs> And because of this, they get held up at gunpoint by a very familiar voice. Oh, holy shit. Barney. Merle's back, mother frickers. And he's replaced his severed hand with an awesome looking blade. Now, yeah. how's about a big hug for your old pal Merle? I'm a tired. When Andrea wakes up, she sees they've been taken to this makeshift hospital, where Merle comes in to question her about where his brother is. And you know he means business when he sits in the chair bad guy style. When Andrea tells him about all the people who died in the group, including her sister, Merle surprises me when he shows Andrea some sympathy. She was a good kid. I'm sorry to hear it. Merle does get irritated, however, that they don't seem all that thankful for being taken in, with Andrea basically being given free healthcare. So Andrea does the smart thing and thanks Merle for the help. Michonne, on the other hand, remains untrusting and cynical to this place. Get used to seeing Michonne like this. She basically sulks the entire time they're here, and it doesn't make her character very likable. I'd rather take more chances out there than stay here. Because your gut tells you there's something off about this place. It's kept us alive this long. 
the governor gives him a quick tour of Woodbury, the town he's taken over and fortified with the help of the community. Michonne insists that he gives them their weapons back and lets them go, and the governor assures them that they're not being held prisoner here. They're free to go in the morning when the gates can be opened. The next day, Governor checks in on the helicopter pilot and finds out that he's got a squad posted up down the road from where he crashed. Tell me where they are and I promise if they're still alive, I'll bring them in. We'll see what the governor does with this information later. He has this scientist guy who researches walker behaviour and after examining the two walkers that were with Michonne, he theorises that she was using them as camouflage. Without their jaws they had no way to feed, so their instinct to kill disappeared and this somehow signalled to the other walkers that there's no food here. But I thought walkers could still smell that you weren't dead though, like we were shown in the first series. Eh, I dunno, I'm not gonna keep questioning logic when we're talking about a zombie show. While eating breakfast, Michonne goes wide-eyed when the scientist suggests that she knew the walkers that she had on chains, and I believe we get more of a backstory on this later in the series. The governor drives out to the troops pretending to be a harmless messenger boy, innocently there to tell them that their pilot survived the crash. But it was just a dirty trick, with the governor's army hiding in the surrounding fields. <laughs> When he brings the army supplies back to his own community, it becomes clear that the governor is power hungry, taking out any competition that might threaten his position as the most powerful leader, and he lies to his community about his good deeds out on the road. I promised that bring him back here alive. If they didn't have our walls or our fences. Andrea quickly comes to admire him and tries to convince Michonne that this is a good place to stay. And well, she's not 100% wrong. For the time being, it seems that if you're in this community, you're pretty safe. It's just that the leader of this place happens to be a secret psychopath who keeps walker heads alive and floating in fish tanks, including the helicopter pilot's head. This episode is amazing. It's equally as suspenseful as it is heart-wrenching. The opening is very mysterious as some unknown person has broken the lock on the prison gate and leaves a trail of animal parts to bait the walkers in. The guys are preparing for a supply run and they call out for Glenn who's knocking boots with Maggie. Hey, what's up guys? You comment? What? You comment? But I already came. I like these moments where the gang feel like real friends having a laugh with each other. Herschel's up and about too, and everyone is happy to have him back, but the smiles abruptly stop as the freed walkers close in, and the prison alarm mysteriously activates. We'll check in to see how these guys are dealing with this after a quick visit to Woodbury. Michonne is snooping around, getting suspicious of the governor's story as to how he got the army trucks. On the opposite side of the fence, we have Andrea who's getting friendly with him, knowing that being under his protection is a better option for her than being out on the road with Michonne. She's also helping Merle by giving him information on the last place she saw Daryl, so she's playing it really smart in becoming friends with the two most powerful figures in this community. It's because of this that Andrea becomes much more bearable to watch. She's not whining and complaining here, she's just being very clever. Alright, now back to the chaos. Everyone gets separated as they try to take out the walkers. T-Dog gets a surprise bite from behind, but manages to free himself to get to Carol. Later on, he sacrifices himself to let Carol escape, and this was a cool way for him to go. He was never the best character in my opinion, but his noble sacrifice here earns him some respect points. Laurie starts having contractions, so Carl and Maggie get her to a safe point. They plead for her to put a cork in it and not have the baby until they can get to Herschel, but this baby is not waiting around for anyone. It's coming right now. Unfortunately, things don't go to plan, and Laurie knows that the baby has to be born through C-section, a procedure that without medical supplies will kill her. Seeing the writing on the wall, she has a final heart-to-heart -heart with Carl. You gotta do what's right, baby. You promised me you'll always do what's right. You're so good. I never really liked Laurie, but this scene is hard to watch. The idea of watching your mother die while enduring so much pain is gut-wrenching. I would say it's even harder to imagine this if you were just a kid, but let's be real here. We never stop feeling like a kid who needs their mother. It doesn't matter if you're 10 years old or 30 years old. The baby's born and Carl knows he needs to be the one to end his mum before she changes. 
pretty heavy stuff. Meanwhile, Rick, Daryl and Big Ball Steve get to the generator room and find that the prisoner who got away earlier is the one behind all this. When presented with an opportunity to take out Rick, Big Ball Steve decides taking out the prisoner will prove where his priorities lie. He shows Rick that he's committed to being a part of this group. When they get outside, Rick hears the baby crying and he turns round to see a distraught Maggie and Carl, but no lorry. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> this is such an iconic scene, and it still hits hard despite this being turned into a meme. Oh no. <laughs> Woodbury's having a party and everyone's having a good time, except for party pooper Michonne. Seriously, just kick her out already. We cut to the governor brushing a young girl's hair, and she turns out to be his daughter who turned Walker. Take it easy. Come on. Sorry, I'm here. Daddy still loves you. You know that, right? This scene's burned into my memory, watching him desperately trying to control her and settle her down, not willing to accept that his child is no longer alive. Speaking of kids, the newborn baby is in desperate need of baby formula, so Maggie and Daryl head out on a supply run. But wouldn't you have stocked up on baby formula during the many months of Laurie's pregnancy? It's not like this baby came as a surprise to anyone. I'm a jump scare. Well, anyway, they go to this preschool and manage to find a good amount of baby supplies and also this juicy possum for dinner. Hello, dinner. I'm not putting that in my bag. Rick has become a broken man, going on a walker killing spree to get to Laurie's body. Yeah, everybody's worried about you. You shouldn't be in here. Again, we have more superb acting from Andrew Lincoln. He legit looks like a man on the brink of insanity. When he gets to the room where his wife was, all he finds is her wedding ring. The rest of her is inside this walker, who just had an absolute feast. And now he's having an after dinner nap like a grandpa at Christmas time. Michonne, who is still snooping around, comes across a cage full of walkers and promptly takes them all out, much to the annoyance of the governor. He tries once again to convince Michonne to ease up on her suspicions, but she's having none of it. She then forces Andrea to decide there and then if she's going to stay here in Woodbury or join her on the road. Oh man, what a tough choice. I can't possibly decide. Do I live outside having to constantly be on the run, always having to sleep with one eye open? Or do I pick this lovely warm bed with food and a shower? Are you coming or not? Thanks, bye. That evening, Andrea starts to suspect something is strange about this place when the community gather round to watch Merle have a boxing match as they're surrounded by walkers. <laughs> the governor explains that this is a way for people to blow off steam and learn not to be afraid of the walkers, seeing them as just entertainment. But Andrea's not 100% sold on it. As Rick lays there imagining the sound of his baby crying, he also hears a phone ringing, but this time it's not in his imagination. Or is it? It is, possibly. Keep watching to find out. Merle and some others have been ordered to follow Michonne, and she decides to leave them a message using Walker body parts. Go back. What? The arms are a G, the legs make an O, and that's a back, it says go back. They decide to ignore the message, so she jumps out at them for the attack. <laughs> Now, the way she lands here suggests that she only fell a couple of feet, but we can clearly see that she's out of sight in this shot, as she's hidden in the tree, so she would have needed to be at least seven foot up, and yet she lands without bending her knees. So to me, this attack looked kind of silly. Well, anyway, she gets shot in the leg and flees the scene, but Merle is straight on the chase, accompanied by a weak-stomached, wussy guy with curly hair. But if you keep announcing to the world that you're pissing your pants... I'm going to have to smash your teeth in. He has no first name, but I'm going to assume it's Craig. Michonne comes back in on the attack and some walkers join in. 
After this scuffle, Michonne is again nowhere to be seen, and Craig tries to convince Merle to go back to the governor with the bad news that Michonne got away. Merle, being a loyal dog who doesn't dare disappoint his owner, wants to cover up the story and be the hero that survived the ordeal, leaving no room for smaller, curly-haired dogs. You hear that bird? Rick refuses to leave the phone as people keep ringing to ask him questions, and yet they conceal information about who they are and where they're from, almost as if these people don't actually exist, and Rick has created a way to speak to himself about what he's going through. But then again, maybe they do exist. Who knows? Keep watching. Michonne spots Glenn and Maggie on a supply run and she overhears them talking about the prison. But before she has a chance to approach them, Merle rocks up and gets aggressive because they're refusing to take him back to the prison so he can see his brother. Now I know Glenn doesn't like Merle, but that is a bit harsh, isn't it? It's his brother, man, come on. And if I was Glenn, I'd definitely want to stay on the good side of a guy with a knife hand. Merle takes them hostage and orders them back to Woodbury, leaving the baby formula on the floor. When Rick starts to realise that maybe these phone conversations aren't real after he hears Laurie's voice, he finally goes to hold his baby daughter for the first time. When he then goes to get some fresh air, he sees something unusual at the gate, so walks down to find Michonne holding the basket of baby formula. Also in this episode, Andrea beds the governor, and I think they make for a nice couple. She likes long walks on the beach, and he likes keeping heads in jars. And they also find Carol, who is almost dead from dehydration. Merle is interrogating Glenn and trying to make him feel bad for when he left him on the roof. But Glenn is no longer a boy, he's a man with hairs on his chest now, as he's seen a hot woman's boobars in real life, so no longer does he get easily intimidated. <laughs> The next stage of the interrogation is more just a serving of sweet justice for Merle, as he gets Glenn to fight off a walker while he's tied up. I want to imagine how I felt fighting my way off that roof. Glenn gets out of it by smashing his chair against the wall. <laughs> When he survives this, the governor loses some faith in Merle's ability to extract information from captives, so he takes matters into his own hands by forcing Maggie to undress and basically threatening to do heinous things to her, but not following through and simply trying to show her that he's in charge. It really gives the governor such a dark layer to his character. When Maggie's shown that the governor will kill Glenn, she lets up information about the prison. How many are you? Ten. I'm ten now. Both Glenn and Maggie have shown a lot of balls in this episode, and it really makes you respect them. So you're gonna talk. You do whatever you're gonna do. And go to hell. At the prison, Rick is hesitant to let Michonne in. After all he's gone through, it's understandable why he wouldn't trust strangers. But then Carl shoots some walkers who are about to chomp down on her as she lies there defenseless. <laughs> Taking her into the prison, they get her some water and try to get her to talk. And for some reason, she acts just as untrusting as she did in Woodbury. I didn't ask for your help. Bitch, you came here, and you came with the baby formula, so you obviously wanted to be let in on good terms. Why wouldn't you immediately cooperate with them, especially as they're offering to treat your wound? She does eventually tell them about Glenn and Maggie being captured, but damn, talk about making the situation unnecessarily hostile for yourself. She leads a small group of them to the outskirts of Woodbury, and as they plan their attack, Woodbury are planning their own attack on the prison. Pretty interesting stuff. The opening introduces us to a new group, but we'll only talk about the main two who stick around in the show, Sasha and Tyrese. Sasha isn't all that interesting as a character in my opinion, but Tyrese is the kind of guy I'd follow into the zombie apocalypse. He's loyal and protective of his group, and he seems like he always tries to do right by everyone. Even when this dude's mum gets bit and everyone knows she's done for, he insists that it's too early to take her out. This of course is a pretty stupid decision for their survival, but the humane side of him wants to respect the wishes. He leads them into the back of the prison where the walls have been knocked down, and so the episode begins. The governor's singing a nursery rhyme to his walker daughter, but she's all like, man, shut up and pass me some meat. And he gets frustrated when she won't look at him. Look at me. Look at me! 
Back at the prison, Carl spots the new guys and helps them take out the walkers that they brought in with them. But when they get back to C Block, Carl locks them out. And it's really funny to hear Sasha complaining about being locked up and treated like an animal, while at the same time thrashing against the cage like a frustrated animal. Oh, come on, man. We're not animals. Don't do this. Hey! You can't just leave us in here! Open this door! <laughs> The funniest slash creepiest part, though, is Steve casually finding out if Beth is legal yet. How old are you, anyway? 17. 17. Interesting. Uh-huh. And what's interesting about that? No, go on, tell us. Tell us why it's interesting, hmm? Carol jumps right in the way and gets him to put his dick back in his pants. And hilariously, he assumes that Carol's a lesbian just because she has short hair. And that's why he wasn't trying it on with her instead. You're not a lesbian? My, my. This is interesting. No, it's not. You know what? I feel like he's had enough screen time now to earn his real name back. His name is Axel. Nah, that name's too cool for how this guy looks and for how he acts. We're going to keep on calling you Steve. On to a more serious tone back at Woodbury, Glenn fashions two shanks out of a walker's arm bone, and when Merle and his fellow guards walk in, they launch the counter-attack. Quickly joining in on the fight is Rick and company, as they toss smoke grenades into the room, before smuggling Glenn and Maggie back to safety. How this smoke doesn't affect both parties equally is baffling, but we carry on. What follows is a shootout in Woodbury, and this sequence perfectly illustrates my biggest bugbear when it comes to shootouts in TV and film. I really can't stand the trope of people firing hundreds of bullets at each other, and yet for the good guys, they rarely ever get hit. It really makes you feel like the enemy are just firing blanks at them. But when it comes to the good guys returning fire, they kill the target 9 times out of 10. And then to make the scene seem believable, they always kill off someone you don't really care about, like Big Ball Steve. Things aren't all bad though, because this scene of Michonne discovering the governor's daughter is amazing. No! Don't hurt her. He genuinely looks desperate for Michonne to let his daughter go. This fight between them was awesome. You got the floating heads being smashed out of their tanks, and then Michonne stabs him in the eye with a broken piece of glass. <laughs> Andrea then walks in, confused as to what the hell she's seeing. Why is her boyfriend now blind in one eye? And why was there a little girl tied up in his dungeon? Daryl gets captured by the guards, and the governor uses this as a way to test Merle's loyalty by ordering them to fight to the death. You wanted your brother. Hey, got it. Merle attacks Daryl, but tells him to play along as he's got a plan to get them out. But whatever his plan was gets overtaken by Rick throwing in more smoke grenades. I like how the governor looks here as he slowly walks through the smoke, his punctured eye still bleeding through the gauze. Waiting on the road nearby, Glenn can't believe the audacity of Rick in bringing Mel back with him. Rick, struggling to remain the diplomat of the group, explains that it's still Daryl's brother, so they can't just kill him. Mel gets a bit big for his boots and immediately starts mocking everyone. Pathetic! All these guns yeah, and no bullets Darryl, in me? You better oh, shut up! Shut up yourself, bunch of pussies, you run! Daryl realises that there's no way of bringing Merle back to the prison, but as his family, he's not going to abandon him either. So he says his goodbyes and the two brothers go on their own adventure. The townsfolk of Woodbury are freaking out after what happened, but the guards are preventing them from leaving. Andrea steps in to try and take control of the situation, and I like how she thinks that she's become a high-ranking member of leadership all of a sudden, just because she tamed the one-eyed governor's one-eyed trouser snake. The governor later reminds her that she's basically nothing to this town, and just simply a passerby in his personal life. Rick arrives back at the prison, and the newbies try to bargain with him to be allowed into the group. And as Herschel's on the verge of convincing him to let them stay, he hallucinates Laurie standing on top of the stairs. Why are you here? What do you want from me? Death. Hey, easy, Rick. There's no need. You don't belong here! Get out! Please! Relax, get out. relax. Get out. We'll leave. We're going. It's a great way to show how emotionally damaged this man is, and isn't going to get over what happened for a long while. 
Rick keeps seeing the ghost of Laurie, and he spends most of the episode chasing after her. I remember when I first saw this, I found it really irritating and kind of cheesy. And while I still feel the music is a little bit too manipulative, It's not the worst thing ever, and like I say before, it's a good demonstration of how mentally screwed you'd be living with these experiences. I'm writing these reviews as I watch each episode, so maybe if this whole hallucination thing carries on too much longer, I'll remember why I found it frustrating to begin with, but we'll see. With Rick out of action, Glenn tries to become the new leader, but people like Herschel just see him as way too angry to make rational decisions, which in a way he's right, but when you think about the situation, it's almost impossible to make the right call. If they stay in the prison, the governor is likely to attack and they haven't got the numbers to put up a decent defense and they can't go on the run because Herschel literally can't run and they have a baby now which would be a constant dinner bell for nearby walkers. Daryl and Merle are getting frustrated in each other's company with Merle constantly suggesting that he's turned soft and doesn't care about Merle anymore. When we were kids, huh? Who left who then? What? Huh? Is that why I lost my hand? You lost your hand because you're a simple-minded piece of shit. Yeah! You don't As they scuffle, Daryl's back scars get exposed, and suddenly Merle realizes that they both suffered the same physical abuse as kids. Something Merle didn't know happened to Daryl as he was constantly away from home. I, I didn't know he was. Yeah, he did. He did the same to you. That's why you left first. This is such an important moment because it gives justification as to why these two developed such anger issues growing up. But now Daryl's on the mend as he surrounded himself by people who treat him well and he's accepted that he can be part of the group. This next part genuinely made me jump. Maggie's having a casual conversation with Steve and out of nowhere he gets shot in the head. <laughs> The governor's here, and he's just looking to show them who's boss, rather than trying to take out the prison, as is evident by the fact that half the time he just fires his gun aimlessly in the air. Interestingly, he lied to Andrea earlier, saying he had no intention of attacking the prison. How she still trusts him after everything that's happened is a mystery. No one else of any importance gets killed in this attack, but the governor does leave them with a present. It's a truckload of walkers to deal with, but they cleared out the yard easily enough last time, so this will just be a slight inconvenience. <laughs> Merle and Daryl decide to come back to the prison, just in time to help Rick out of trouble. So looks like Rick now owes Merle a chance to prove himself as part of the team. Merle is advising them all to make a run for it, knowing how powerful the governor is. Rick struggles to come up with a plan, but Herschel won't just let him walk away from his responsibilities. Get back here! I put my family's life in your hands. So get your head clear and do something. Herschel may have lost a leg, but he grew himself a big old pair of balls. Get over here! Andrea is once again stepping over her boundaries by giving orders to the community. She also asks the scientist guy Milton, classic science guy name, to help her escape and get to the prison. Milton straight away tattles on her to Mr. Bossman, and it's this scene where he dons his famous eye patch. Governor says he should help her, knowing that so long as he knows what she's doing, he has complete control of the situation. On their way to the prison, they bump into Tyrese and the newbies. Milton offers them shelter at Woodbury, where Rick denied them of that privilege. When Andrea does get to the prison, she isn't given the warm welcome she was hoping for. Everyone's suspicious of her for literally sleeping with the enemy. Andrea rightfully bites back, calling them hypocrites for allowing Merle in while being hostile to her. Which, yeah, is a fair point. Carol advises her to go back to the governor, slap cheeks with him, and then kill him while he sleeps. Better sleep with one eye open, governor. Oh, or maybe just don't sleep at all in your case. She gets up completely naked. Nice. And when she goes to take him out, she sees him all snug as a bug and decides he's simply too cute to die. I don't think I've mentioned this yet, but Beth likes to sing at random times. And I know it's kind of mean, but I immediately start skipping when she starts singing to avoid the cringe. Yeah, I know I'm an awful person. Luckily, I stopped skipping just in time to hear Rick's plan. He's going to head out with Carl and Michonne to find more weapons. And I can still hear her singing in the background, so we're just going to move on to the next episode. One of the more depressing openings, they drive past a man begging for them to stop, and the man continues running after them down the road where they have to temporarily stop. Ah! 
What makes this so damn cold is that later in the episode when they return down the same road, they find his body has been ripped apart and they just heartlessly take his stuff. <laughs> They get to town and find the police station armory is completely empty, but then they get to a part of town where someone set up booby traps to fend off walkers. Leverage, you must find your way out of this place or you will surely die. That someone then pops up on the roof and orders them to drop their weapons and get the hell out of there. Of course, they don't listen and return fire, with Carl being the one to successfully drop the guy. Oh my god, it's Morgan. When Morgan comes around, he attacks Rick, not remembering who he is. This guy's basically gone insane from all the death he's experienced, including his son Dwayne. It takes him a few minutes before he realises that he knows Rick and can therefore let his guard down around him. I know you, I know who you are. Rick tries to convince him to come with him to the prison, but Morgan says he can't stand to lose anyone else, and it's better that he lives alone now. Rick, however, can take a share of his guns, just so that he doesn't go back empty-handed. While this conversation was going down, Carl and Michonne walk off to get baby supplies, with Carl insisting that they also stop off at this restaurant, which is filled with walkers. A great adventure is waiting for you ahead. Hurry onward, Lemmy Winks, or you will soon be dead. All because he wants to get this picture from the wall, which is a nice photo of his family before the world went to crap. This way he can show baby Judith a picture of what their mum looked like. Andrea sets up a meeting between Rick and the governor, where Rick believes they can agree to a territory split. But the governor stops him in his tracks and says, no, this meeting's about your surrender. The governor wants Michonne delivered to him in two days time, otherwise it will be considered a declaration of war. This is another scene that I can no longer watch without thinking about bad lip reading. I once knew a kid, his tongue fell off in his sleep. la bibi di bibi dum what la bibi da bibi do Outside standing guard, the people from the opposing communities are getting to know each other, with Daryl having a manliness showdown with whoever this guy is. Yeah, for menthols. Douchebag. And Herschel is sharing light banter with Milton. May I see it? I'm not showing you my leg. It's important, Dad, huh? I just met you. At least buy me a drink first. <laughs> <laughs> When Rick goes back, he lies to the group about the governor's terms, knowing that Michonne would probably hand herself over if she knew doing so would prevent the war. Herschel gets the truth out of him, and Rick hopes that his wisdom will help him make a decision on sacrificing Michonne. That's all that happens in this episode, unless you count the naked wrestling match scene with Maggie and Glenn. Hey, look at Randy Orton slithering. Oh, watch, like out, watch, out, watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out! Andrea sees the Woodbury foe coming up for an attack, and Milton warns her that the governor's plan is all BS. He's going to kill all the prison people regardless. He then shows her the governor setting up some kind of Fifty Shades playroom, ready to capture, torture, and possibly fondle someone. Oh! Andrea flees Woodbury, warning Tyrese and the others that this town isn't what it appears to be, advice she once got from Michonne and chose not to listen. We, we did listen! But at least in Andrea's case, it's more than just a hunch. The governor learns that Milton essentially tipped her off, and that's why she's running back to the prison. So he goes out looking for her, and at first she manages to hide in some trees. Now I want you to pay close attention to this scene, and tell me what's weird about it. Where the hell did this walker come from? Was he crouching behind the tree this whole time? I do find it annoying in this series how the walkers randomly decide not to make any noise when it's convenient for the delivery of a jump scare. But at all other times, they're making noises like a cat throwing up a hairball. He eventually spots her running across a field and starts honking the horn at her. What? Why? She knows you're there. <laughs> All you're doing at this point is drawing walkers to the noise, and if you plan on capturing her alive, it's not exactly going to help your cause. She hides out in the warehouse, and of course he immediately chooses the right one to go into. We then have an overly drawn out sequence of him slowly walking around trying to find her. The ending was pretty cool though. She does this cool trick where she opens the door to let the walkers through, and hides in the gap between the door and the wall. It 
It doesn't look good for the governor, but of course he's going to survive. It would have been too weak of an exit for such a good villain. She thinks she's about to make it to the prison, but as she goes to signal for help, Governor takes her down. The episode ends revealing that she's now in his playroom. I mean, holding cell. Rick lets Merle and Daryl in on the Michonne deal, knowing that he's going to need help if she's to be sacrificed. Merle offers him advice on how best to tie her up, but then goes on to suggest that Rick doesn't have the balls to do it. Daryl finds Merle rummaging around for what he claims to be drugs, and the two start talking about how each of them has changed for the worse. Merle becoming too cold-hearted, and Daryl becoming Rick's lapdog who just follows orders. <laughs> Daryl concludes the conversation, hitting Merle in the feelings, by saying that he just wants his brother back. I just want my brother back. Get out of here, man. Rick is still seeing the ghost of Laurie, but now he's trying to talk himself back into reality. She's not there. Mel leads Michonne down to a compromised part of the prison so they can clear it out, but this is just a trick so he can knock her out and tie her up. He's taken over Rick's plan to do what he knows Rick would never go through with. Along the way, they find this car, so Merle ties her to a post while he does some hot wiring. He sets off the world's loudest car alarm, attracting every walker in the area. Oh, shit. There's a cool zombie kill where Michonne uses the wires around her wrists to slice into a zombie's neck like it's soft cheese. I've wanted to highlight so many Walker death scenes in this series, but I simply can't because YouTube doesn't like it. Michonne convinces Merle that he's no different to Daryl, as he's trying to prove himself right now by doing Rick's dirty work, all the while pretending that he's his own man. Merle says he will let her go back to the prison, but he's not going back until he does something that he knows he needs to do. He finds a bottle of booze and blasts loud music from this car to create a walker herd. He then leads them to the shed where the governor's waiting for Rick. And this leads to a pretty decent shootout scene. And not a silly nonsense shootout scene like we got in Woodbury. <laughs> Merle takes out quite a few before some of the more competent henchmen knock him down. And the governor steps in to finish the job. I ain't gonna beg. I ain't begging you. No. Rick and Daryl find out that Merle took Michonne there by himself, and so Daryl goes searching for him. But when he does find his brother, it's bad news. <laughs> this look in Merle's dead eyes really sticks with you. I do think this was the right time in the series for Merle to go, as much as it sucks to see it happen. Merle's character was super interesting. His damaged upbringing and troubled relationship with Daryl made you connect with their story. Even if you didn't like them as characters, the quality of their story is undeniable. Milton has shown the consequences of his traitorous behaviour. He also burned the governor's walkers in a previous episode. When he's ordered to pick up his tools, he strategically hides a pair of pliers for Andrea. But he didn't expect that the governor would then command him to kill Andrea to show his loyalty. He foolishly tries a reverse Uno, leading him to being knifed in the belly. And he's locked inside with Andrea to bleed out. I told you you were gonna do it. <laughs> and now you're gonna die. <laughs> and you're gonna turn. And you're gonna tear the flesh from her bones. <laughs> That's some quality bad guy stuff right there. Sasha and Tyrese make the brave decision to decline the governor's orders to attack the prison. Governor, this ain't easy to say. Well, that's not nice bad ugly. Opting instead to stay behind and protect the children. A move that will make it easier for them to become friends with the main group later on. They storm the prison with heavy artillery, but they find the cell blocks completely abandoned. The gang aren't too far away though. They've cleverly hid themselves away in the tombs of the prison, where they gain the advantage through familiarity of the layout, and using the prison alarm to disorientate. Get the hell out of here! They manage to push them back and they flee home. One of the younger soldiers bumps into Herschel and Carl, who were taking cover in the bushes. Carl has a moment of cold-heartedness when he puts down the kid, who was in the process of handing over his gun. 
The governor's furious with his community for retreating so early, and to the surprise of even his most loyal soldiers, he starts mowing down the ones he perceives to be weak. <laughs> Milton warns that Andrea needs to hurry up and use the pliers to get herself out, and I vividly remember screaming at the TV every time she stopped what she was doing to either talk to or check in on Milton. It's like, you know he's a ticking time bomb, why would you ever stop? You need to hurry. Yeah. En route to Woodbury, Rick and the gang find a survivor who reveals what the governor did to Sasha and Tyrese. He killed them. Yeah. They find Andrea dying from Milton's munching, and Rick leaves her his gun so she can go out by herself. I'm glad Andrea became more likeable towards the end, but I certainly didn't shed a tear for this funeral. The season ends with Rick welcoming the surviving members of Woodbury to the prison. 